Hello everyone and welcome to CRAM Surge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Search from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Okay, right. So, um, we're going to talk about multiple testing. Um, previously, we talked about p-values and confidence intervals. So, I'll briefly recap um, that discussion. Um, but if you did want to go back and listen to that talk, um, this might then make more sense. So p-value refers to the probability of getting a result at least as extreme as what is observed if your null hypothesis is true, right? And 95% confidence intervals refers to the interval or the range within which the effect size is likely to lie in 95% of similar studies. So we talked quite um, in detail about these two concepts before, right? We also discussed hypothesis testing. We talked about the null hypothesis and we talked about type one and type two errors. And I presented this two by two table before and I explained um, what the type one and type two errors meant. So essentially type one error is the error we commit when we reject a null hypothesis that is actually true, right? And type two error is when a null hypothesis is false, but the study is unable to reject the null hypothesis. So that's a type two error. And the inverse of type two error is what we call power. So power of the study is one minus type two error, or the ability to reject the null hypothesis when it is in fact false, okay? Now, type one um, error is the same as the p-value that we use for statistical testing. And the conventions, as you know, is to call a p-value of less than 0.05 as significant. Right. With this in mind, let's just uh, consider an example. Let's say um, we're doing a large cohort study of infection um, after major elective abdominal surgery, and we're interested in looking at variables that might predict um, infection uh, or variables that are associated with infection. And let's say that the first variable as part of the study um, was gender. You looked at males and females and you looked at, looked at the infection rates in both groups and you worked out a p-value of 0.15. Now, ideally, uh, you want to put down confidence intervals as well, but there's not much space here. So I've left the 95% CIs out. Now, obviously, 0.15 is well over 0.05. So you would consider this as a non-significant result. So you'd either say um, that maybe there is no difference between gender in terms of infection rates, or you might say that uh, the study is subject to a type two error that it is unable to um, show a difference when uh, or if a true difference actually exists, right? So if you have a p-value of uh, more than 0.05, you either accept or fall back to the null hypothesis or you say, uh, maybe you did, you've done a type two error. Now you could look at more variables. Let's say we looked at smoking as well uh, and looked at infection rates in smokers and non-smokers and you've got a p-value again of more than 0.05. You've looked at um, history of previous laparotomy uh, to see if that predisposed to infection and you've got a non-significant result and you can carry on and on. And let's say that then you uh, finally with a particular variable, such as incision here, the type of incision, you've got a significant p-value. Now, when you get a significant p-value, you might say, well, I've got enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis that incision is not associated with infection after major abdominal surgery. Or you might say that you've committed a type one error, that actually there's no difference, but um, the study has shown a spurious difference, okay? Now, if you're doing multiple tests, you could argue that just by chance you get a significant p-value. 
And um, here we've done one, two, three, four, five, six tests. And you could ask the question, is the type one error rate or the p-value still only 0.05%, right? And that'll be a valid question because you've just done um, tests on as many variables as you could, you could get your hands on. So that's the issue with multiple testing or multiple comparisons. If you've done a single test, the chance of falsely rejecting the null hypothesis is one in 20, which is the type one error or alpha. And it also goes by the name, the false discovery rate. Uh, in other words, you're saying you might have uh, stumbled on a significant p-value when actually no difference exists and therefore you're making a false discovery. So it's called FDR or the false discovery rate. And it all refers to the same concept, the same as type one error, it's the same as alpha. Now, if you run more tests, logically speaking, you're gonna increase the problem of false discovery. You're going to be um, making claims when there really is nothing to do with claim. So with, if with one test, the risk of type 1 error or alpha is alpha, then the risk of not making a type 1 error is going to be 1 minus alpha, right? With multiple tests, the risk of not making any error, any type 1 error in any of these tests is going to be 1 minus alpha to the power of m. So just bear with me, this is important to, to kind of get a, a grasp on the amount of false discovery that can happen if you do multiple testing. So with multiple tests, the risk of making at least one error is going to be one minus, one minus alpha to the power of M. Uh, in other words, what we're saying is that if you do five tests, 10 tests, 15 tests, the risk of making at least one error is going to um, become more and more and more. And this is what some people refer to as a um, family-wise error rate, right? Now, if you want to plot a graph between the number of tests you're doing in your study, and this could be a randomized control trial or an observational study. Uh, in the example we're discussing, it's, it's simply an observational study of infection after major surgery. If you do more and more tests, the false discovery rate is going to go up and up and up, yeah? Uh, to the point that if you do almost 100 tests, you're extremely likely to get a spurious result just by chance. And um, if you do 10 tests, for example, and you come across so many studies that do well over 10 tests, and the false discovery rate is 0.4. If you do 20 tests, the false discovery rate is 0.64 you're more likely to get a false discovery rate than not, right? And this is a big problem in clinical research. Right, so what are the solutions? So what can we do about it? Now, some would argue or have argued that maybe you shouldn't do multiple tests. Maybe you should just repeat another study for each hypothesis. But you, can, you, you probably realize that that is just not practical, just not feasible. And you can even argue that it's not ethical either, that you, uh, you subject patients, if it's an experimental study, to more and more trials, each trial addressing a single hypothesis. That just doesn't work. Another uh, potential solution is to do the uh, tests, do whatever tests you think um, is appropriate, but interpret them cautiously. Uh, that's a practical suggestion, but obviously that's prone to misuse and misinterpretation. You know, what's cautious interpretation for one person would be a bit rash for others. Right. You could um, do a validation study of the discovery. Let's say you've done a study and you've shown that maybe gender, maybe age, and maybe something else potentially is associated with the infection because you've got p-values of less than 0.05. And then you say, well, actually, uh, this is an exploratory study and we will have to carry out another study just looking at the variables that have been shown to be significant in the uh, initial study, right? But obviously that'll have to come later. That'll have to be a separate study that you've got to um, conduct on a separate population. And another suggestion, and this I think is extremely valid, is to say that you will plan your study, even if it's an observational study, you'll plan it in detail and you will submit the study proposal to some kind of uh, review body, or you might even publish it online. 
And in the study plan, you will clearly say what are the risk factors you think you're going to analyze and why you're going to analyze and what's the biological rationale for uh, including those variables. And you will simply stick to it, right? That's um, a very sensible approach. It reduces the temptation for researchers to just stroll through the data looking for interesting variables or any variable that they, they can get their hand on um, and then they look for significant p-values. It doesn't have a fully address the problem of multiple testing, obviously. You're still doing multiple testing. It's just that it is planned. You could do some simple statistical adjustments, like the bond ferroni correction, and we'll discuss the bond ferroni correction in a minute. And this kind of adjustment of the p-value will reduce your type 1 error rate or the family-wise error rate. But what it'll do, on the other hand, will be that it'll increase your type 2 error. In other words, it'll make the study less powerful. In other words, you might ignore some really positive findings. And to um, negate that, to reduce the impact on your type 2 error, there are some complex statistical adjustments that you can do. But I think that's beyond the scope of the stock. Okay, so these are the potential solutions for multiple testing that we've got to think about. Now, let's just look at a simple um, correction called the Bonferroni correction. You might have come across this before. Um, if not, you will, I suspect, come across this in many observational studies. So let's just have a, uh, let's see if you can understand what the Bonferroni correction means. And if you get this, then um, if you did want to use this, or if you did want to look into other types of corrections, then it might make things a little bit easy for you. So the aim of the Bonferroni correction is to reduce the risk of your type 1 error or um, the risk of falsely rejecting the null hypothesis. Now, in other words, um, reduce your family-wise error rate. So the way you adjust uh, or correct the uh, p-value that, that you get is simply take a p-value and divide it by m. And m is simply the number of tests you've done, okay? For example, if you do six tests, then the p-value for each test, uh, when you're doing significance testing, should be 0 0.05 by, divided by six. Six is the number of tests. That's roughly 0 0.008. So you're aiming for a p-value of less than 0 0.008 before you reject your null hypothesis, okay? Now, if you do that, and in a study you've done six tests, then your family-wise error rate, um, which is a formula we discussed before, um, as is shown in the slide, will be 0 0.047, which is very close to 0 0.05. Okay, so if you've done the Bonferroni testing, uh, you can be reasonably satisfied that uh, you've reduced your type 1 error rate as much as you possibly could. Um, and then therefore, going back to the graph that we discussed, the graph that shows you the relationship between the number of tests you do and the false discovery rate, you apply bond per only correction and you can keep the false discovery rate to 0 0.05 or less, right? So this seems good. However, what's the problem? The problem is keeping the um, type one error low comes at a price that increases your type two error. Or in other words, the power of your study goes down which means the probability of ignoring a significant result goes up, okay? So that's not um, uh, great for a number of reasons. Now, there are a number of other tests, and these are all listed in this slide. These are slightly less conservative in that they don't impact on your power of your study too much. However, they're a bit more complicated, and like I said, you're better off getting some statistical um, advice if you want to do this. Right. So the problem with um, doing statistical adjustments for, for multiple testing is that it becomes a little bit illogical and a little bit silly in some instances. Now, we've just discussed a paper that uh, looked at um, differences between two groups and differences in the risk of incisional hernia uh, in patients with and without a mesh. And they also compared lots of other variables between the two groups and also between people with and without a hernia. So do we then adjust for all of these baseline comparisons? And if you do that kind of adjusting, then it'll be very difficult to show differences between groups. The other thing is, if you do um, 
a large observation study and then use the data set for a future study looking at another interesting sort of hypothesis, what do you do? Do you adjust the new analysis? And do you then go back and say, well, actually the, uh, the paper that we published before hasn't been adjusted and therefore we'd want to adjust it and publish corrections? Uh, it becomes impractical. And what about outcomes and risk factors that are related? So you, you have sets of outcomes that are very related to each other and similarly sets of risk factors that could be related. And how do you adjust the degree of adjust uh, the, the correction uh, depending on relatedness? For example, if you look at outcomes such as infection, you've got superficial and deep infection. And if you um, add in further outcomes such as readmission, reintervention, quality of life, they can all be uh, very related to each other. And therefore, if you have a significant association between a variable and superficial infection, for example, it's also very likely to have an impact on deep infection and on readmission and so on and so forth. So correcting them, um, correcting the analysis using something like the bond product correction just seems really harsh. Similarly, if you are looking at risk factors for infection, and um, if you consider a risk factor like smoking, and then another risk factor like poor nutrition or alcohol intake or occupation, Again, these are risk factors that are very related to each other, and you get the same problem. And if you insist um, and adopt a very rigid attitude towards correcting for multiple testing, what's to stop researchers and authors um, salami slicing the publication? What's to stop people from saying, fine, in this study, I'll report on these three or four important risk factors, and then I'll just do another study and report on another three or four risk factors and you know, looking at the same data set. So that'll be a problem. So there are all these problems with, with insisting on statistical adjustments for multiple testing, which is why a number of journalists these days do not insist on born ferroni correction or other kinds of um, uh, statistical adjustments. Right, so what have we learned? What's the summary? So I hope I've, um, uh, I've shown you that multiple testing in observational research particularly is, a, is quite a significant problem and there are no easy solutions. My suggestion would be to plan all your analysis as much as possible a priori and be clear and describe this in your study proposal and try and stick to it when you're doing your analysis. Be transparent about your primary outcomes and your secondary outcomes, your primary endpoints and your secondary endpoints. Be very clear about what, what your um, key endpoint is and what, what your other um, endpoints are going to be. And when you're writing your report, when you've done your analysis and you're putting it all together, um, let the readers know clearly what the effect size is. Um, uh, for example, if you're looking at smoking, let people know what the infection rate with, uh, in smokers um, is and what the infection rate in non-smokers is, along with the p-values and conference intervals. And then the reader can decide, not just based on the p-values and conference intervals, but also on the absolute numbers. And if you've done a lot of uh, multiple comparisons, then explain the caveat. Explain that this is an um, exploratory work and that you've done multiple testings and that when it comes to secondary outcomes, the, the results, the significant results particularly, have to be uh, validated in further studies. And finally, um, uh, remember that you don't always have to um, adjust for multiple analysis, especially if you made it clear that you plan the analysis and that um, the authors have explained that um, this is exploratory work and, need, and this needs further validation. Thank you. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep coming alive with our surgical podcast.